again this morning. Thank him for the wonderful moving of the Spirit of God yesterday, for that uh, flow of prophecy, and the I thought the singing was superb. And then last night to hear that wonderful message that we heard from the beginning, but it had new emphasis, new meaning last night, didn't it? You come through many things since that first day uh, that we heard the message on life. You know, I have appreciated, I think, everything that has taken place in this move of the Spirit, especially after you go through some of the things you appreciate it better. But I have appreciated all the phases of this move of the Spirit. But there is nothing that has been more pronounced and more paramount in my thinking over the years than the message of life. It's one message, I don't care how much death stares you in the face, that was made so real by prophecy and by teaching in the early part of the move of the Spirit that I've gloried in it all during this part of the move of the Spirit. Whether you feel you have, as Brother Berg was ministering last night, much of it, it's the message we need. We need life. You know, uh, it's a strange thing. I don't know how many of you put stock in the Reader's Digest, but... uh, uh, I read a little nugget in there many, many years ago, and even they have more sense than some people, and it said this, we don't only need more years to our life, we need more life to our years. You didn't catch it yet. Haven't, hasn't got through yet. I'll say it again. We don't only need more years to our life, we need more life to our years. Uh, you got it that time, I can see. Well, uh, just before I lead this morning... Uh, Brother Berg came over and told me about the uh, uh, fire is uh, uh, curtailed, and I thought I might not say it as well as he does because he heard the news. So you come and tell him, and then Brother Holt's going to lead us in prayer. I was listening to the news this morning, and they were telling about the fire around Canal Flats that we prayed about last night. And they said the fire has been contained or uh, it's not moving any closer, although some of the town has been evacuated for safety's sake, and I suppose on account of the smoke and one thing or another. But I thought I'd tell you this just to bolster up your faith, and uh, let's just keep believing God that all things will be well. Uh, We thank God for answered prayer, and I'm sure it gives a lot of peace and rest to those who are here that have homes there that Uh, could be wiped out in an instant if the fire went through the town. Uh, But God is able to do all things, and he's able just to put his hand on that thing and and watch over it. But uh, I was thrilled this morning when I heard the news, and I thought I'd like to tell it to you. Amen. I'd just like to pray with you this morning. Nothing to no particular request, but just have that desire in my heart. There are things that that come in teachings that are very wonderful, and I have noticed people trying to do the impossible thing uh, to make their heart stable. Uh, the the mind has, is the only reservoir for information or it hasn't the ability to know. It is not designed to know. So that Paul was able to say, I know in whom I have believed that he is able and that he can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that I can ask or think. That was not an exercise of his mind. That was an exercise of that knowing that can only come to you by the Holy Spirit. You understand that? Many of you know from your walk with God that he has unlimited ability. He always acts in the absolute. But he has put within the human life a portion that is called a spirit. People can worship God. It doesn't mean anything to God, but they worship God in the solical uh, system. They call it soul music. It has no value whatsoever to God. 
He doesn't pay any attention to it. He'll turn it off like you would turn it off. But the singing in the Spirit, by the Spirit, prophesying by the Spirit and not by the soul like many can, but the Spirit development in you is the only the only channel that you have where you can deal with the absolutes. And that's why Paul, knowing from that walk with his God, that he could say, I know in whom I have believed. I was reading the work of Carter, the former president concerning the Near East, and he said 1948, the year of 1948, is the most epic year in human history. It is one of them for the end time. I believe the greatest time was when God was manifest in the flesh by his son Jesus to make available the quickening of the spirit that is within you. So that many times intuitively, I use the word intuitively, I don't know what it, what his full import is, but intuitively you can know and yet not understand. You can know and yet not understand. You cannot give the mental analysis. That's a strange thing. And time and time again, I, that thing has happened, and I wondered about it. And I, 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 then all of a sudden it dawned on me, one is the actual act of the Holy Spirit within you. You have the embodiment of the Spirit. And we were reading last night, and the teaching last night is to enter into life. And some of you will know that you can do it. And it's beyond all natural reasoning. And you won't possibly be as hilarious as you may feel, but you can still know. You can still know. I'd like to pray that the Holy Spirit would make that so real to us this morning. Not by feeding my mind. I don't want, my mind is just a gathering system for information. It's loaded with libraries of things. But it's my heart that believes. I cannot make my mind believe. I've never been able to do it. But there's come a time intuitively when my heart knows. And I was, I wasn't aware that it, the, the, the systems of it, but the, it is the Holy Spirit within that allows you to know, for with the heart a man can believe, um, by, a, by the heart a man can create, by the channel of faith. Unlimited, you're entering into unlimited realms, the realms of the absolute. And God is bringing a people up to that where you'll lose all your jigging and your jiving and all that other swinging back and forth to one fanciful thing and another. You will know. I can't remember the things that Brother Hunt once taught us, something about the first was feeling. But if it's something that God's just dropped into history to suit you. But the real realms are beyond it. Endless life is beyond all of that. You Time and space is just, it's related just to this system of the God dealing with humanity. But now we're getting the feeling of going beyond. We're getting that something going beyond. I don't want to talk so. Father, this morning... As we have deliberated over these things before thee, we want the we want that that you have written in the records to come leaping out of its pages to arrest our hearts and our minds and our understanding and all these things. But Father, allow the quickening of the Holy Ghost to come upon us. Allow the illumination of thy Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see those Elysian fields, to see the power of change that you can make that you have whispered into the ears of the prophet 
when you said we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. We look forward to that change. Allow in this course of meetings, Father, the change to come into those that are weary with the years. The years have worn them down, but Father, allow us to see beyond that. Allow us to see those those realms that you talk about as you insert the passages before our eyes, that he came to bring life and life abundantly. He came and bore away the transgressions and all the limiting factors that we have stumbled over in most of our life to bring to pass that great memorable day when mortality shall be swallowed up by immortality. Father, oh, stand with us, whoever ministers. Stand with uh, the ministry of the Word. Stand with the ministry of prophecy. Stand with the ministry of singing. Every channel that you have opened, as you said at this time, you would restore these gifts to the church, that we might enter into these great fields of life. Let thy blessing rest in an unusual way, O oh, my Father, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Just worship the Lord for a few moments. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Praise thy wonderful name. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. Praise thy wonderful name. Oh, Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Praise thy wonderful name. Hallelujah. Praise. To God. As Brother Holt prayed this morning, I felt that I wanted to give thanks this morning for all his goodness. <clears throat> Only a few weeks ago, my wife was taken deathly ill, and uh, you'd have to understand, live with my wife for quite a while, to know that when she said, I'm so sick. She's really sick. She never said that in the 42 years I was married to her until that night. She'd minimize something. If she ever had anything wrong with her, she'd minimize it. 
But that night she said several times, oh, I'm so sick. You know, I, I thank the Lord for the doctors, but sometimes they can be a lot of help. I phoned her doctor that night and I uh, said, what should I do? Because I'd come to the end of myself. And uh, he said, well, you could do one of two things. He said, if you can't look after her there, you could take her to the emergency. <laughs> well, I pretty well knew those two alternatives, but I wasn't sure which one. So anyway, as I took her to the emergency, you would know in a case of that kind how that in the natural you would be very troubled and and uh, concerned and all the rest of it. And uh, when we got into the emergency room there, there was a peace that came over me. <clears throat> a confidence. That's all I can say is peace and a confidence that came over me that right from that day to this, I've sort of been able to ride on a, I don't know what else to express it, I call it a spiritual high. Just a confidence. And, uh, you know, the enemy comes around in those times and he said, well, do you still believe in divine healing and life as much as you did before? I believe in it more. Praise God. Because if you knew the whole circumstance of it and know that if it hadn't been for the uh, sustaining hand of God and his healing virtue and all the rest of it, one of two things, my wife wouldn't be here or she would be totally paralyzed. And she's here, as you can see, and uh, she has no paralysis. So uh, we just want to give thanks to God for that and for all your prayers. She can't begin to answer all the letters, so I just want to, in a kind of a blanket form, thank everybody for their prayers and for their cards and expressions of get well and so on. They were all wonderful. There were, I don't know how many of them. I lost count after a while, but when there was well over 30, I strung them up across the whole wall so she could see them and remember all those that has, had expressed their wishes for her to get well. And then she got, I'm sure, that many or more afterwards. The many people that phoned and said they were praying, and many phoned that couldn't get a hold of me because I was at the hospital from 8 till about 10 at night, from 8 in the morning till about 10 at night. And uh, so I just want to, if you will excuse us for not replying by word of uh, letter, or by letter, and just thank you all so much for all your wonderful kindness and prayers and so on. Brother Crawford will probably do it himself now he's here. He asked me a while ago if I went to the churches, if I would express the same appreciation for you, Brother Crawford. You can do it again. But uh, I want to do that since I didn't have opportunity to get to many of the churches after Brother Crawford told me that. And uh, I'm so thankful to God. I, I was thinking the other day how thankful I am for all the brethren here, for the ministries. You know... Uh, I heard somebody say one time, oh, this move of the Spirit binds me. This move of the Spirit set me free. And though I have brethren that can help me to stay in the right track, and I hope I have a little part in helping them, you know, that is the greatest safeguard, the most wonderful thing that God has done in all the earth. You know, when people get a little of the understanding of God's great plan, sometimes they will leave a denominational system. But oftentimes they get into something that's far worse. They get into a one-man kingdom, or, or they get into something that has no order and no true shepherding, and then they do one of two things. They either go back to the denomination or go right out in the world. But God has set an order, and it has never changed from the beginning. It was there in type and shadow back in the Old Testament. And it's there today just the same. And it's the greatest, it's the most wonderful thing. God set in the church those five ministries for the laying of the foundation. God set elders and deacons in every local church. And God has brought together a body, as you can see here, and with every member beginning to function in their ministry, and he said that when that happened, that it would grow into a holy temple in the Lord and even make increase of itself. I believe it has done that, and so, uh, pardon me if I just 
go over that a little bit. I, I'm so thankful to God for our, not only the ministries, but I'm thankful for that truth, that paramount truth that came right from the beginning of the coming together of the body of Christ. We are enjoying it today. So I just wanted to say a thank you uh, for all that you have done. I, I just want to mention one little thing. The day before the uh, doctor discharged my wife, uh, he came into the room and he sat down and chatted with us uh, for a few minutes, and he was pleased with her progress. But I should tell you this part. I think this would be an encouragement to you in answer to your prayers. Two days before that, the specialist, Dr. Siemens, had told me, he said, uh, you know, your wife has got a little paralysis in her one hand. And uh, so I was concerned about that. And so uh, when he was gone, I got my wife to move her hand every which way, and I couldn't see any paralysis. And uh, so when her regular doctor came in a few days later, I told him about it. I said, you know, Dr. Krochak, I don't quite understand. I said, I appreciate uh, Dr. Siemens. And I said, he, he said, my wife had paralysis in her, hand, he, uh, in her hand, and I said, I can't see any. And he said, well, we'll soon find out. So he put her through all the tests, and he said, well, I don't know what Dr. Seaman saw two days ago, but he said, she doesn't have any now. So uh, we're thankful to God for that. And so I, I thanked him for all he had done. I believe in doing that. I believe that we should thank people, don't you? We should be truly thankful. And so I thanked him. For all he had done, and I did the same with the nurses. They were the grandest bunch in there. They used to joke with me, which helped. One day they told me they're going to put me on staff. And, and uh, so they figured I was doing such a good job with my wife, they're going to put me on staff. And I said, well, just hold on a minute. How is the pay? <laughs> and uh, But anyway, uh, when I expressed that to Dr. Krochak, he said, you know, we can't heal. I don't think he's a religious man, but he said, we can't heal, but he said, there's one up there that looks after that. And, you know, I was looking to God for a word to, said, to say to him, and I said, yes, we know him. That's all I said, we know him. But I said, sometimes we get little help, other help too, and I want to thank you for it. So that was just briefly some of the things that happened, and uh, I'm so thankful to God this morning for all he's done. The, uh, I felt to talk to you this morning, I didn't even want to say when we were gathered together, the brethren, because, uh, to, you know, we, we've got away from that of wanting to preach sermons. If anybody still is, is uh, itchy to preach sermons, I want to tell you something the Scripture says. If you think preaching is all that great, the Scripture says that he chose through the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So it's all right. It does a wonderful work. It... Uh, it saves those that will believe, and I guess if we keep on uh, preaching this message of life, Brother Berg, it will bring us into full sonship and into the kingdom, the fullness of it, I mean. And uh, so it's all right to do that, but uh, I don't get elated over preaching sermons when even the Word of God says itself it's foolishness. And uh, uh, I'll tell you something that a brother that uh, was a real forerunner of this move of the Spirit that went before us, and he was talking to a lot of young men that were training for the ministry one day, and he said, uh, I'll tell you one thing, he said, don't preach or prophesy after you're finished. You think about that for a minute. I'm afraid I have to confess sometimes I have done a bit of that after it was finished. Maybe you have too. But anyway, we're going to try not to do that anymore. Uh, Brother Berg, I was thrilled with the anointing and with the message that you brought last night. And uh, when my wife was in the hospital and couldn't read, I used to read to her every day. And I felt, read to take, I felt led to take a little booklet along about the life of Brother Smith Wigglesworth. I read that to her. And uh, uh, he had a little nugget in there about life that I want to relay to you. Um, he had a great desire to live and enter into life like you and I did. And uh, he contemplated it. But because he lived in that period before, God just one day took him home just like that didn't die of a sickness. But uh, he was contemplating this one time, and, you know, one of these real bright fellows come along, and he said, well, Wigglesworth, uh, I think you're kind of a little visionary. He said, don't you know that a man's years are three score and ten? And Wigglesworth always seemed to have a word of wisdom. And he said, where did you get that? He said, in the 90th Psalm. He said, I'm not living in the 90th Psalm. I'm living in the 91st, where it says, with long life, 
will I satisfy him and show my salvation. So then the same fellow a little later come along and taunted him because Wigglesworth had made the expression. He said, well, I would at least like to live as long as Moses lived, 120 years. And uh, so this same fellow come along and he said, well, what are you going to say then? He said, I'll go back to the 91st Psalm and I'll say, with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. Well, we're not where Brother Wigglesworth were. We're standing on the threshold of the kingdom. We're standing, Brother Berg, as many had mentioned yesterday, on the threshold of that new day. I contemplated, I anticipated, I wake in the middle of the night and anticipate it. Glory to God, and, and I want to press into it with all that is within me. Well, could we sing something? I am going to minister to you. I don't know how long this morning. I want the brethren to stand ready. If I should finish halfway through the meeting this morning, well, they'll stand ready and minister to you. But, uh, uh, yeah, Hazel's here. Uh, could we sing together? Let's just stand, shall we? And uh, sing together, we are gathering together unto him. I believe that, as never before, that we are gathering together around that glorious risen Christ. Hallelujah. And uh, you know where that scripture comes from, that that song is based on? comes from the very beginning of the Bible, where one day it said concerning Israel and so on, it said, uh, The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and then unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Isn't that something? Way back in Genesis, that scepter wouldn't depart until he would come, and then unto him would the gathering of the people be. Sing it with all of your heart and enter it. We are gathering together.
I want you to sing this morning, and I looked up in it to try to look it up in that book that you usually use in the church. I couldn't find it there, but maybe Brother Witter has a book there. If you can find it, would you give it to me, Brother Witter? I'd like to lead you in that song, Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross. There a precious fountain, free to all, a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. I'm not sure I know the whole hymn. Is there one of those books around? Oh, here's one over here. Uh, you know, that's what I want to talk to you for a little while this morning. Thank you, Jimmy. About the work of the cross. The Lord seemed to make many things real to me concerning the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. They may be, as Brother Berg said, they may not be new, but they thrill my heart. And I want to talk to you about them in the light of today. And so while we sing this, come on, I need some help here. Look it up for me, Brother Witter, will you? And while I talk, you look it up. Oh, here's somebody's already got it. Thank you. You can have that one then, Brother Witter. Doug, you come here and help me sing it, will you? (laughs) Praise the Lord. Jesus, keep me near the cross. And while we're singing this, I would like to ask Brother Baker if he would come. He sang... A couple of choruses down the line of life. And uh, just before I ministered down in the new work there at uh, where Brother Crawford is at uh, Big Spring, these couple of choruses that have to do with life, Brother Baker ministered them just before I ministered that Sunday morning. And the words of them and the life of them have been thrilling my heart ever since. So, Brother Baker, wherever you are, you just come with your guitar and stand ready after Brother Witter helps me in this song here. Glory to God. Amen. Jesus, keep me.
bring its scenes before me. Help me walk from day to day. With its shadows o'er me. Amen. Everybody. Hoping, trusting ever, till I reach the golden strand, just beyond the river, near the, in the cross, praise the Lord, sing it together, near the cross. Brother Baker with us this morning from down in Texas. By the way, Texas is big, isn't it? But we've only got a little congregation here. You rest you sit down now, will you? The Texas keeps standing. Brother Crawford, you'll have to stand right now. And, uh, yeah, and Sister Mans, there's, uh, oh, there's more. Oh, yeah, there's some back there. They're scattered all over the place. That's the way with Texas. <laughs> take the whole of England and put it in a little wee corner of Texas. The Englishman replied, looks like you could do with a little bit of England in Texas. <laughs> Brother Hunt really challenged me last night. 
for the reason that I was born. Being what I am, I always thought I was to be a warrior. So I joined the Army when I was 15 years old. I didn't enlist to die for my country, but I enlisted to get total victory. But I found out that anybody can squeeze a trigger and kill a person. But God has an army that's going to give life and not take it. For I was born to be God's dwelling place, a habitation for the presence of the Lord. So let my life now be consecrated unto thee. So I might be what I was born to be. To the glory of our God who transforms this earthly clod. Though the promise seems to linger Yet a while He will every part fulfill The full counsel of His will Bringing forth a man In whom there is no guile Earth in wonderment shall stand just to see God's perfect plan scarcely believing what they long have searched to see a creation fully new in the image of the truth one new man possessing perfect liberty. Have you counted the cost to walk this way? Have you paid the price to behold my face for to behold the living God means to walk away from yourself to die to self to leave yourself behind to be empty to be nothing that Christ in you may be all in all. Have you counted the cost to walk this way? Have you paid the price to behold my face for to behold the living God means to walk away from yourself to die to self to leave yourself behind to be empty to be nothing that Christ in you may be all in all. Be on the veil. I now would go 
into the secret place to look upon his face. I see such beauty there, none other can compare. I worship thee, my Lord, beyond the I want to pay that price, don't you? He paid the full price. He went all the way to Calvary. And you and I, through that, can stand in his likeness. I'm so thankful that we are at least beginning to learn the lesson that we could never in a thousand lifetimes change ourselves by ourselves But I think of it much the way our dear brother Charles S. Price used to speak of it. He said, it's not the striving life. He said, it's the let life. Let him have his way in your life. Let him change me. Let him transform us, as our brother was singing, transforming that earthly sod to make that one new man of perfect liberty. That's what I'm sure we all want. Now... Uh, This morning, just uh, uh, for a moment or two, uh, I want to just mention something. You know, uh, I'm glad that I had uh, a good, uh, what should I say, I'm glad I had a stern father. My father believed in keeping the rules and trying to get get us to keep them. He uh, did his best to make us toe the line uh, before you say, well, what happened to you? I better tell you that, that he did his best to, uh, and uh, he was a kind father in many ways, but he was stern. And there was times that I used to think that he was a little over stern. But when I started to grow up and uh, realized that I was going to have to take my place as an adult, I thank God for every bit of correction that my father had given me. And I think you young people, uh, this morning, you'd be wise to just think this over pretty seriously. And if your father or your mother seemed uh, to you to be hard in correction, uh, seemed to be towing pretty close to the line, I'm going to tell you as one who is older now, you'd be wise to listen. Because it'll stand you in good stead. It'll save you many a pitfall. And I give honor to my dad today for he's long gone to the glory, but I'm I'm thankful to stand and in honor to him today for uh, endeavoring to bring us up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. What I said that for was my dad one time that he corrected me. Maybe I should say my father. That word dad isn't too good a term. But uh, my father, uh, one time when he was correcting me, and he, he said this. He said, Bob... No ifs and no buts. You ever hear anybody say that? I suppose I could say, well, Dad, what if? Or I could say, but, you know, this. And he said, Bob, no ifs and no buts. And I got to thinking about that in later years. And I thought, but, you know, there's a lot of ifs and buts in the Scripture, isn't there? I'm going to just mention one or two things this morning. But uh, I want you young people to take these things pretty serious. I'm not going to tell you who the young man was, but I heard a young man talking to his father one time. He wanted to do something oh so bad, and his dad, his father knew that it wasn't right, so uh, and the timing wasn't right, so he said, no, he said, it's too late for now. Maybe some other time, it's too late. And the boy, you know, kept on with his persuasiveness. You know how young people can be. And uh, finally said to his dad, well, dad, won't you think about it? I tell you, my dad wouldn't put up with that after all. He instructed me. There was no time for thinking about it. But the young lad said, well, Dad, at least think about it. (laughs) I don't know whether your son's ever said that to you or not. But uh, young people, you better think about it very serious. 
Take the admonition not only from your earthly fathers, but from your spiritual fathers, from the members of the body of Christ that are trying to help you to walk in a more perfect way before him. And I can just tell you this, it'll stand you in good stead. I was thinking uh, when I was meditating down that line one day, you know, uh, the Lord uh, told the uh, uh, Cain and Abel and uh, Adam and Eve and those uh, about his plan of redemption and uh, at that time, looking forward to Calvary, they were to bring a lamb as a substitute, as a sacrifice, and as atonement for sin, only not that the blood of a lamb or of a bull or of a goat could take away sin, but it was all pointing forward to Calvary. One day that uh, John the Baptist would come across the meadows and he would announce, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. But all these sacrifices before were pointing to Calvary. And uh, both Cain and Abel, I'm so sure, should have known what God required. But And uh, so Abel brought the lamb. But uh, Cain thought, oh, I don't like that way. I don't like that kind of sacrifice. I'll go out and get a, a basket of fruit or whatever it was, some of the produce of the garden. I'll get the very best one I can. And surely when I present that, the Lord will be satisfied. And you know, the scripture says that the God did not have regard to Cain and his sacrifice. And Cain was angry. Isn't it a strange thing? We get corrected where it's so easy to get angry, isn't it? That isn't new. That was a way back with Cain. And uh, so it says Cain was angry. And this is what the Lord said to him. If thou doest well, there's your if. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? But he said, if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. There's one of those great ifs of God back there in redemption. He should have known what God required. Had he done what God said, he would have been accepted before God. Uh, the other day in the university, or in the St. Paul's Hospital, uh, when I was up there with my wife, I met a man who had been in the Saskatchewan legislature, later, pardon me, years ago, and uh, he was uh, Catholic by bringing up, but uh, uh, he seemed to, uh, some way or other, uh, be, we seemed to be drawn together in conversation. And I was sitting outside the door of my wife's room one day when the nurses were busy, and he came along and he sat down and talked with me, and uh, uh, he uh, he invited me down to his room. And uh, he told me that he, he he thought, he wasn't sure at the time, that he thought that he had cancer in his lungs, and uh, he found out later that he did in both lungs. But anyway, uh, the door opened, and we seemed to strike up quite a friendship. And uh, one morning when I was in, I, I looked to the Lord for the way to open, and uh, the Lord seemed to give me real liberty, and I outlined to him the way of the cross, the way of salvation through Jesus Christ, that through believing on him, that we could be justified by faith as though we had never sinned. And uh, so in reply to that at the moment, he said, well, he said, I guess I'm not very good on the inside. He's a very fine-appearing man, real gentlemanly type of man, and we won't hold it against him being in the legislature, will we? But he was uh, a very, very fine type of man and would open up very easy. And uh, I said, well, there again, my brother, I said, I want to show you that it's only Christ's righteousness that can make you good on the inside. Then I said, after that, you have been made righteous by the blood of the cross, then I said, you can go on and walk with him, and he'll give you more and more of the impartation of his life. And I even mentioned to him that that could lead us to sonship. So I went as far as I could. And uh, he seemed to take it all. And uh, so the one night I was going, and I just slipped in for a minute, and I, uh, he said to me before I left, he said, will you pray for me? And uh, so I, I prayed with him, and uh, he said, keep on praying for me. And uh, so that night when I went home, I woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning with him on my heart. And uh, so when I went back to see him the next day, 
He said, uh, I believe you're praying for me. I said, yes, I woke up in the middle of the night last night with you on my heart. And uh, so uh, I, that's what I, I want to talk to you, not about the simple uh, experience which you all have. I, I don't, I'm sure that most everybody, and I trust everybody that is here this morning, has been justified by faith, uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. If you have, I want to talk to you this morning about some of the other aspects of the cross, and I'm going to turn to a scripture just now uh, that's found over in the book of Galatians. If you'd like to turn with me, there's a couple there that I I want to read, and uh, these uh, scriptures are very uh, precious to me this morning, and uh, uh, because I want to talk, first of all, about the, uh, the way of the cross, and then... Uh, God gives me the liberty about the uh, the effects of the cross and the work of the cross and so on. And uh, but I'll start here with this scripture, which is found in the uh, sixth chapter. Just a minute here. Got the wrong the wrong chapter here. Um, yes, yeah, it is the sixth chapter. And uh, the I'm going to read two verses. Uh, first of all, I'll read the 12th verse and then the 14th. That's uh, Galatians 6 and verses 12 and 14. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, that's what they did in that day, only lest that they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. And then the other verse in uh, four, uh, uh, verse 14 But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, or except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Uh, I want to say this morning that the the cross of Jesus Christ is is one of the great pillars or pinnacles or I don't know how else to say it than that, uh, of the whole plan of God. Uh, we, we sang a song a year or two ago about it expressed it this way that there was a line that was drawn through the ages. And on that line stood an old rugged cross. And then it, the song went on to describe, uh, the victory and the effects of the cross. I want to say to you this morning that the, this cross stood in the center of the ages. If you know anything about the dispensations, there were five dispensations before the cross and two after that would fill up time. And uh, you and I have, I believe, almost concluded that one since the cross. I believe that this age of grace is almost completed, don't you? Or am I saying something different? You believe that this morning, don't you? It's almost completed. And I'll tell you why that I believe it is almost completed is because the kingdom now is being announced. Isn't that a wonderful thing? John made the people alert about it way back when he baptized those people under repentance, trying to prepare the way for the coming of this one. And he said at that time, he said, there's one coming after me. And he said, I'm not worthy to to stoop down and unloose his sandals. And and, uh, he knew that he was the Lamb of God that would take away the sin of the world. And John knew something else. He said, he's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And he said, he's got a fan in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his house. Glory be to God. That's part of the work of the cross, Brother Berg, that is going on and bringing us into full light. Is that purging? And uh, uh, so, but if John could declare that back in that day almost 2,000 years ago, that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, how much more in the closing of this great age can we say it's at hand? Oh, sometimes, sometimes I feel when the glory of God comes upon us that the door is almost ready to swing wide open. And we'll walk out into the light and glory of that new day. I know we're experiencing a measure of life and a measure of those things now. But the day is coming, glory be to God, when we'll uh, come into that glorious age. 
You know, uh, I don't know too much about all the judgments of God that will happen in the end of this age. I want to be alert. I know that God will always judge sin, won't he, Brother Holt? He'll always judge it, and he'll judge it severely because he can't look on sin. Sin is something that isn't in uh, the area of God whatsoever. And uh, so uh, the judgments of God, uh, one of the patriarchs said that when the judgments of God are in the earth, people learn righteousness. And so the judgments of God are in the earth today, and they're coming. I don't know too much about all that's going to happen, and then certainly in this move of the Spirit, we do not speculate about all the unfolding events. We may feel this is coming. We may feel the events would unfold this way. But because God has shown us another phase of it, we are not quite so concerned about the externals. We don't want to stick our uh, head in the sand like the ostrich does, thinking that's safety when trouble comes. But we know that it's coming on the earth. We know that devastation is coming. I don't know too much about that, but I do read in the Scripture where it says that cities will be laid waste without inhabitant. Did you read that? I read of other things where the land will be without man. I saw the prelude to a film. I don't go to shows. I better say that on the start, but I saw a prelude to a film on the television one time, and, and the title of this thing was uh, No Blade of Grass and No Place to Hide. That's the way they pictured it, but I'm not going to talk to you about that this morning. But the judgments of God are in the earth, and when they are, the people will learn righteousness. That's what the Scripture says. But I want to tell you this, that when devastation and trouble comes into the earth, we have a place of safety. And that's what I want to tell you about this morning. Glory to God, it says, and the, uh, the psalmist David pro proclaimed it in no uncertain terms. He said, A thousand will fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it will not come nigh thee. Glory to God. Now, what I want to say about that is this morning, Brother Burke, I want us to be able to dwell continually. I want us to learn to dwell in that secret place of the Most High. Not just to visit there, but to dwell in the secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I know most of you, or a number of you, I know Brother Wager has, have read some of the works of uh, uh, Andrew Murray, and I, I have enjoyed, I have a number of his books, and I enjoy every one of them. Here was a little man of God who weighed less than a hundred pounds, nothing in the natural that would attract anybody, and yet I was reading some of his writings the other day that talked about sonship and life. Glory be to God. Man that lived, what was it, over a hundred years ago? How long, Brother Wager? Pardon? At the turn of the century. Well, that's good enough. That's pretty near a hundred years, isn't it? Eighty-five anyway. And uh, uh, I, uh, I got a, a book the other day, a paperback book, that I'd heard about years ago but had never been able to find in print. And you'll laugh if I tell you where I found it. I found it in a Goodwill store. You say, you go to the Goodwill store? I do if I want to find some good paperbacks that I can't find in Brother Danny's bookstore there. He, I don't know whether he's got this one or not. If he has, I'll advertise it now. It's titled, Abiding in the Vine. Have you got that, Dan? See if you can get it. Glory to God. But it's a wonderful book, Abiding in the Vine. And he brought out so many nuggets. And one thing he said that astounded me, he said... You know, the vine is not without the branches. Isn't that something? The vine, is, the vine isn't there. The stem isn't there alone without the branches. That somehow or other, our glorious Christ has joined himself to us, that he will not be without us. It staggers me. But he said, uh, as uh, I wish I could quote all the scriptures on that, but he said that, uh, uh, he, he gives us much about abiding in the vine. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. But I'm going to tell you something. 
You won't just get what you want by spending all your time in worldly things, in worldly pursuits. And then all of a sudden, you think the Scripture, well, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it, and then come and, and try to get it that way. You won't get it. I've got sad news for you. But if ye abide in me, if you abide in the vine, you're going to have the life of the vine. That's how we get that life, Peter. Is if we abide in the vine, that glorious life you were talking about last night is going to flow into us. It's going to flow out from us. Glory be to God. I was just thrilled. You would like anybody here, I'm sure, would enjoy reading this book of Andrew Murray's is because it's a number of chapters and everyone's only about three pages. It's sort of a devotional thing. I can sit down in the morning for just a few minutes and read one. And uh, I feel like I've just had a great big meal. It just made me want to walk that day, want to be joined to the vine more than ever before. Well, I know that the brethren uh, could, could give a, a recommend that our brother's writings are good. We don't adverti- advertise all, all the writings that are on the market today. There's a lot of stuff you'd be better to uh, either never get or if you got it, put it in file 13. I didn't hear any amens when I said that, but uh, anyway, I got a lot, I got some stuff that I got quite a few years ago that I guess still in my library. I'll have to sort it over one of these days and get rid of some of it. But uh, there are a lot of good things there that I want to keep. So anyway, the um, I want to get back now to this work of redemption. Paul said here, he said, if any uh, desire to make a, show, a fair show in the flesh. Uh, he said, uh, of course, back there the thing was circumcision, the deterrent. And he said, uh, uh, they constrain you to be circumcised, uh, and uh, they don't want to suffer persecution for the cause of Christ. But I want to tell you this morning that the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ will separate you from the flesh. The work of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ will separate you, as our brother sang this morning, from yourself and from flesh. And I want to be separated from that, don't you? Uh, a sister told me here a little while ago that someone was ministering. I have no doubt that this person maybe was ministering in all good faith. I'm not being critical when I say this. But they used the expression, just be yourself. And uh, probably what they meant was, don't try to put on ears. That's possibly. So I'm not being derogatory. But uh, this sister said to me when talking about it, she said, I don't want to be myself. I've been that too long. (laughs) I think that's the way I feel, too. I've been myself too long. That old self that always gets you into trouble. Not talking about just being Bob Oldridge. I'm talking about that flesh that has always gotten us into trouble. But anyway, uh, I want to say that the, the cross of Christ will separate. It separated those ages that I talked about in the beginning. One of the things it'll do, it'll separate you from the flesh. It'll join you to him in the spirit. That's what it'll do. And you'll begin to know him. You'll begin to know the flow of his life. I long for it more and more. There are those times when he lifts us up in heavenly places that I wish I could never leave it. Glory to God, Brother Berg. I believe that if I could just stay in some of those uh, high places spiritually, I don't believe I would die. I don't think I'd know whether I'm going anywhere or not. I I haven't even got a plot in the cemetery. Around a few years ago, they were selling uh, plots in the memorial gardens and trying to use all the convincing things uh, to try to get you to buy one. Well, maybe you think I'm foolish for not. I know it doesn't make a man have to die because he buys one. But I, maybe I'm like Brother Witter, just a little bit of Scotch nature in there, or the English nature, the Scotch got over there somehow or other. But I'm not going to buy anything I don't need. I'm not apt to buy anything that I'm not sure I'll need. Brother Livingston, he's smiling now. He said something to me one time. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Anyway, but uh, I, I have the uh, the uh, uh, oh, reputation of being uh, frugal. And, uh, uh, okay, I've suffered a little persecution over that. But uh, I'll tell you something, I'm not going to start to give away what little money I got foolishly either, so don't come looking for it. But, you know, 
Uh, they th how did I get onto that? I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, it will separate. It'll separate from the flesh. It'll separate from all that great thing that men build. A great work among teenagers. And I was in the area where he was, and I, I felt to go and see him. He was glad when I phoned him up. I told him where I was from. He was glad. Uh, and when I got there, he said, I have heard of you. I thought, well, that's sure strange. How would he hear about a nobody like me? You've heard of him. Everybody's heard of him because of the work he did among teenagers. But how would he ever heard of me? So I asked him, I said, well, how would you have ever heard of me? He said, well, Brother Warnick, he said, spoke of you one time when I was talking to him on the phone. I don't know what. I hope it was something good. But anyway, but I want to say this. Here's a man that God has dealt with. He may not be on the level you're on. He may not have had this wonderful order made clear to him that you have. But one thing I do know through talking with him, that he has been to the cross and God has stripped him of everything in regard to kingdom building. And Brother Berg, I want to tell you this particularly because I know that you have no use for rock music and neither do I. And I want to tell all the rest of you young people this this morning... I better be careful. I was, I was ministering down in South Dakota, and I was ministering about uh, to the ladies there. I was telling them not to ever join women's lib. I said, forget it. You're already liberated. They're the ones that are bound. And so then I, I said, well, I guess I better be careful. And Brother Miller was sitting there, and he said, yeah, you better. So uh, I'm going to be careful, a little bit careful maybe. But uh, uh, I'm just going to say to you young people this morning and the older young people, uh, that are, have good ministries in song and that, that have been used of God, will tell you the same thing. So not only the ministries will tell you that. But, but leave that thing behind. Forsake it. It's not of God. I don't care how many fine Christian words you put to it. It's not right, Brother Burke. It never will be right. And now I want to tell you what Brother Wilkerson told me down that line. He, he, he told me about his experience with this, uh, a so-called uh, Jesus movement. And he said, you know, that started out. He said, I had a lot of success in, in bringing people to Christ when that started out. But he said it went sour. That's the way he expressed it. And so I said to him, well, what happened to it? I know God used it on a certain level. And I said, what happened? And this is what he told me. You listen carefully now. He said, those young people were willing to give up their alcohol most of them, they were willing to give up their drugs. They departed from their illicit sex. But he said one thing they were not willing to give up was their rock music. Did you hear that? And he said that's the reason it went sour. He said they didn't go all the way. And well, that's so much for that. Now I'm, I'm going to be careful. I'm going to get out of that area there. But I, I want you young people to know it. And if I sound hard this morning, I'm only trying to be emphatic. But just as our brother sang, you should leave that behind. You should just leave it where it belongs, because I think it belongs better out in the jungle than anywhere else I know. So, so don't do it. You learn to sing the songs of Zion that worship and, and, and glorify our Lord Jesus Christ and edify the body, and you'll be doing what's right. Praise his wonderful name. And, and uh, so I'm going to say a little word when I'm talking about the work of the cross and bringing separation from the flesh. You know, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to mention this because I thank God for doing the work that he did in our brother's heart, and I hope that he will show him someday more of the realities of life and of the kingdom of God. But uh, uh, the Lord stripped him of everything that he had. He stripped his wife's health, he told me, uh, that she had five ailments and four operations. And I said, how is she now? And he said, now she's well. And I was thankful. He had a daughter that was stricken with cancer, and I said, how is she? He said, she's well now, too. And we thank God together for that. But he told me about many of these things, that he had a, a little experience in kingdom building. I'm only saying these things this morning. I don't want you to... Follow, wander after and try to follow our brother. I'm not saying that this morning. What I want, I'm just trying to illustrate something here. And uh, 
He said that uh, he he had he, to express it in his own words. He said, uh, "I had the sweet smell of success." But he said, "One day God visited me and told me that I must forsake it all if I would win Christ." And he said, "The voice of God was so strong." He said, "He told me to get rid of a five million dollar ranch that I thought was great." And would be a great asset to the work. He told me to get rid of it. So he said, I left it behind. He gave it to some other group that was, he felt was doing a good work. He gave it to them, walked away from it. There are many other things that could complete the story. But, you know, the, the cross will strip us of everything that is contrary to the kingdom of God. Uh, it'll strip us. And uh, don't you worry if sometimes the north wind will blow. When the north wind blows, the trees lose their leaves. They lose their foliage. And, and they're absolutely stripped. Nothing uh, very picturesque to look upon. But you know, just as God ordained the blowing of the north wind to do that stripping, He also ordained the blowing of the south wind to bring resurrection life. Glory be to God. He said, Oh, south wind, Come and blow upon my garden, that the fragrance may come once again. Oh, glory to God. Let the winds of God blow over us, as long as they can bring us to life and sonship. Glory be to God. And you know, I'm appalled at what men do and think they're building the kingdom of God, building all manner of things after their name in the flesh. And I'm not here to, to uh, bring names this morning. But I've heard of one fellow that has a great big establishment, and now he's going to build a miniature Disney World to attract people to it. Another fellow, he wasn't quite having all the attraction. He claims to have some of the gifts of the Spirit, but it wasn't attracting just as much as he thought, and so he's going to put a whole bunch of water slides in. Well, the cross of Christ will strip men of things like this, that they're going to follow the kingdom of God. I'm not saying anything against water slides. I didn't say anything against it. But you don't build those and, and try to put them in with the kingdom of God. You build the kingdom of God. I'll never forget what our dear brother Charles S. Price said a number of years ago. He said, if I were to preach on a topic, when will Russia invade the Persian Gulf? He said, I could fill the largest auditorium in the country. But he said, when you talk about sonship and dying out to self, he said, you'll have the remnant. That's what Charles S. Price said himself. But Paul knew it long ago. Let me read it again. He said, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they'll constrain you to be circumcised, and they'll constrain you to send all your money to their establishment and to do a lot of things that God didn't tell you to do at all lest they should suffer persecution of the, co of the cross of Christ. I'm going to leave that part of it. But I'll tell you another thing the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ will do. It'll separate you from the world. You believe that? I don't believe you can walk hand in hand with the world and walk in the way of the kingdom. I don't believe you can. I, 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 when I was down, I mentioned this too, and then I won't say any more about that. But, uh, Brother David Wilkerson said to me, he said, you know, I've had a vision. And he said, I can't shake it. And he said, I'm going to write it in a book. I didn't encourage him to or not to. I didn't say anything further on it. But, uh, he saw, as he pictured in his vision, great judgments coming to America. Whether that'll be in the way that he pictured or not, I'm not prepared to say because I don't know too much of what the Scripture says about the Western world. But there was one thing after he mentioned this in the first part of the book. He went on, and uh, he, he seemed like that he felt called of God to do that, because God had put him through it. And he really went after many of these so-called full gospel ministers that were divorced and remarried and drinking alcohol and all the rest of it. And he said to them in flat terms, those things have no place in the kingdom of God. And I'll tell you, if any of them would read it and listen, there ought to have been some repentance. You didn't know that was going on, did you? 
but there is a good percentage. A while ago it was 25 percent. Now they say it's more of Pentecostal ministers in the United States that are divorced and remarried and living that kind of a life. Well, I get off of that too, but uh, that doesn't belong to the kingdom of God. And I'm thankful that God has set solid guidelines and an order that we're in. And I'm not here this morning to condemn somebody that has is, is had a hard time. Uh, maybe you didn't grow up in the home I grew up in. Maybe you didn't have all the benefits that I did. But whatever your place is today, if there's anything in your life that doesn't fit into the kingdom of God, or there's anything in my life that I want to repent of it. Because I want to walk in the ways of the kingdom of God. If you are in some unfortunate situation, leave it behind. Uh, confess and, and dedicate your life afresh to God. Then you'll be surprised what he can do for you then. And that's what the brother was indicating in the last chapter of his book. That if they would repent of all these things, then God would visit his people, forgive their sins, and heal their land. So much for that this morning. Uh, Paul said, I want to read now the 14th verse. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Not glory in kingdoms, not glory in great buildings and great accomplishments. But he said, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Glory be to God. Oh, hallelujah. I'm so thankful that God is separating us from the world as well, or has separated us from the world, aren't you? Glory be to God. The world is a lot of things, isn't it? I'm not one of these that uh, get off on a foolish thing like that and tell you to throw your television set out the window. I, if you can't control that thing, maybe you better. But if you can control it, why, that's all right. But uh, I don't know how you feel about it, but there's 90% of the stuff that comes over that that's no good. Am I right? Sure it is. You know, I got pretty well narrowed down that I don't listen to much else but the news. Even Brother Livingston, a hockey game, gets you into a lot of fights, doesn't it? Oh, he's not saying. <laughs> in fact, they, they, the fellows that do that kind of thing tell about all that's going on in the hockey thing and wonder if they shouldn't change, make a lot of changes. I'm not out to say any more about that. But uh, there's a lot of things that you can do. There's a lot of things that if you do them in a certain way, they belong to the world. I didn't say the hockey game belonged to the world. I didn't say that. But there's a lot of things you're going to have to cut the line. You cannot feed on a lot of things that feed the flesh and expect to enter the kingdom of God. I hope I have a few friends left after I get through this seeds this morning. But I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to be honest with my own convictions. I want to walk with God. And I'm going to tell you something, young people. The more you walk with God in the light and the glory of that fellowship with him, the less you want of any of those things. Those things will fade. Something that was a, a, a tremendous thing to you, you thought it was necessary, you, you, you indulged in it a lot. Later on, when the presence of Christ filled your life, you wanted no more. But is that not right? Yeah, praise God. And uh, so, uh, he said, he's crucified unto the world. Glory be to God. I'm thankful for the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ that is making those kind of separations. You know, the uh, one thing I am thankful for is that not only did Jesus have to go the way of the cross, he did, you know that. I, I've often marveled at it. You know, there was one day that they wanted to crown him king. And uh, they took the lowly way as far as that was concerned. They put him on a donkey and strewed palm branches in the way as he uh, followed the, uh, the way into Jerusalem, the way of the cross, finally to the cross. But he didn't become king on the throne there, did he? No, they, they crowned him and said, they said, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. But he never took the throne. And then a little later, Pilate said to him, I'm confused. And well, he would be confused if he hadn't put his life in the hands of the master. 
And um, he said, uh, they say you're a king. Are you a king? He said, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world. Why don't you take the kingdom? How can you be a king without a kingdom? But he said on one occasion, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, you would do just like any other kingdom. My servants would fight for it. But my kingdom isn't from hence. Glory to God. And I'm thankful for that. But I'm, I want to tell you, the kingdom of God is not among the politicians. But I better get off of that one, too. I said to my friend in the hospital that had been in the legislature, and, you know, he was sort of joking a little bit about some things that he encountered in, in politics. And I said, well, you know, I never expected too much from the politicians, therefore I wasn't too disappointed. He laughed at that. But it's not there. And the kingdom of God doesn't come by observation. You know, there's a fellow down, did you hear about this the other day? There's a fellow down around Hague that says he's Jesus Christ. Another one of those fellows that comes off the horizon all of a sudden. Yeah, I don't, I, I can't understand for the life of me how a man could think anything like that. Could you? Except that he's inspired by the other force. But, oh, glory be to God, his kingdom is coming. It's not of this world, but it's already being formed. Praise God, it's well on its way. I thank God that the kingdom of God is already being formed in this body. Do you realize that? The order of the kingdom is here. I'll be glad, Brother Holt, when elders rule in the universe or in the world, won't you? The old crime bill will be down to, to nil. Instead of everybody struggling to pile up a million, everybody will have all they can handle. He says that right? Yeah. Just give you that little good news ahead of time. And you won't have to strive for it and all the rest of it either. You, you, you enter the kingdom of God. And it says that he uh, that spared not his own son, but delivered up him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely give us all things? The... One brother one day quoted it, and he said, You know, the Scripture says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And he said, I sure live well on the added. And we're living pretty good on the added too, aren't we? I didn't hear anybody complaining. But uh, I want to get back to this, and uh, I, I hope that you will... Brother Livingston's not walking out on me. He's got a dental appointment. <laughs> I thought I'd let you know that. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Glory to God. <laughs> you know, I always hate when people walk out on me. I remember one time, this is years ago now, back in about 1951 when I was in Cuba, and uh, I was ministering at a place there, a very fine brother. Uh, uh, what I know about this brother was that when I met him, he was down in the tabernacle on his knees in prayer. That uh, drew me very close to him because I knew he was a man of God. But uh, so he asked me to stay and minister in the tabernacle area. He had a congregation of about 200 people, I guess. And uh, so I was waxing eloquent as I thought. I do that once in a while, not very often. But uh, all of a sudden, about a third of the congregation got up and ran out on me. I thought, oh, dear, what have I said? You know, I just couldn't figure out what, was, what, was, what went wrong, you know. So anyway, after I asked the brother, I said, what, what, what was the trouble? Did I say something that offended them? He said, oh, no, he said there was a little crash out in the street. He said they all went out to see what was going noticed, I noticed quite a few of them filtered back in after a little while, so I felt better after that. But they heard some little thing out there, had to go and see what it was all about. So anyway, I'm glad Brother Livingston didn't walk out on me. The cross is either an instrument of shame or of glory. And it's Christ that turned it from an instrument of shame into glory. The Roman cross was that on which criminals found their end. And, and isn't it a strange thing? I never understood uh, for many years why that the, uh, the type back there when the children of Israel was, were plagued with so many diverse diseases, that I guess it was Moses he told to uh, put a serpent on a pole. A, br a brazen serpent, a brass serpent on a pole. And uh, I thought, I know that many of these things are types and shadows 
of the coming of Christ and his glorious work of redemption, but how could a serpent be a type of him? But you know what the scripture says? He became sin for us who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, the serpent and the serpent of brass, all it indicates is is sin judged. Brass is a type of judgment. And so the brazen serpent was sin judged on the cross. And that's what Christ did for us, didn't he? He took, and and I'm going to say this again this morning. I love to say it. And I know Brother Holt and many of the rest of you love to say it. I'm so glad that healing is in the atonement. I'm so glad that when the blood flowed from those stripes on his back that Isaiah of old declared he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities, but by his stripes we are healed. Oh, glory to God. There's healing and there's life. Oh, glory to God. You know, the enemy will come around and he'll try to impose something on your body. Look at my hand here. You ever see anything like that? It's all black on the back. Maybe I'm turning into a different color. I don't know, but there's nothing wrong with it. I looked at it at the dining uh, table yesterday, and it was twice as black as it is today. I thought, what in the world have I done? So I went and saw one of the nurses, and she, oh, I didn't see anything exactly like that before. And uh, I don't feel anything, so there's nothing wrong with it. But... Uh, the enemy would like to probably tell me I'm mortifying or something. But I'm not. Glory to God, I never felt better in my life than I feel today. I feel a surge of his life, and especially now when the anointing of God is on us. I feel life. Glory be to God. But he'll come along with something, a little thing like that. For the Berg, I think you talk about it, you get a little pain in your stomach, and you think you're getting old. You ever get a pain in your tummy? I get one every once in a while. Nothing. Good. You told him what's wrong, so I won't have to. He said, either eat too much or eat too fast or something, so I try to slow down. But, you know, you'll get those. And the enemy can start your thought channel working. If you let him, he'll make you think before long you got cancer. Is that right? Well, the word says right, so it's right. But I want to tell you, it's, it doesn't need to be cancer. Glory be to God, and it shouldn't be. And if it is, glory to God, throw it off. There's life for you. There's healing. I know that's right. And I had a skin cancer healed, and the Lord did a job of it. I, I had one. I'm sure that's what it was because it didn't heal. All the, all, all, I didn't go to the doctor. But, but as they describe it, I'm sure that's what it was. And where that thing appeared, I had one of these large brown spots. Did you ever hear the ads on television? A lady said, uh, there's these brown spots. And the fellow says, oh, it's through the childbearing years. You get those. And she said, they call it aging. I call it ugly. And so I always call this thing ugly and hope someday it would disappear. And, you know, when that infection got in, the thing it was right here. And I'll let you see it. And there's nothing there today. And God touched it. And he not only healed whatever it was, but he took away the brown spot. And I know, saints of God, he's healed many of you. You could all stand up here and testify of many healings, some from cancer, some that you uh, were crippled and now you walk, and many, many other things. And before these meetings are over, there's going to be a lot more people that are going to be able to testify of those things. You're going to have a new surge of life. Don't think anything else. Glory be to God. And I'm going to say, like I've often said, don't ever get comfortable with your sickness. Brother Crawford didn't get comfortable with it. I know that first night we visited him in that rehabilitation center, the first time I visited him in that rehabilitation center in Dallas, and uh, Brother Coltis and myself and some of the others were standing around. He asked us to have prayer with him, and uh, we prayed, and we no sooner got done praying, and he swung that old leg out of bed there, just like he swings it over this pulpit sometimes. I don't know how he did it. But anyway, he was wanting to throw off everything of that as soon as he could. And I want to say that to every one of you. If you've got something that's been troublesome, look to God that now is the time. That it'll be, that thing will disappear. I believe that with all my heart. 
And if you still have a pain tomorrow morning, look for it to the next day, it'll be gone. I believe that with all of my heart. I hope that many of you will walk out here perfectly whole, like you have never been before. Oh, glory be to God. I believe that. And I'm going to give you a scripture. You say, well, there's, there's a lot in the scripture, isn't there, about affliction? Yeah, there is. But this one says, this light affliction, which is but for a moment. Isn't that what it says? Not very long. Moment isn't very long, is it? Just a little short part of your life. And if an affliction comes, that's the way it should be. It should come and go. I believe that with all of my heart. And Brother Berg, I'm going to go with you and, and continue to talk about this message of life until we're fully in it. Glory be unto his precious name. Well, how's the time? I haven't looked at my watch once. Well, it'll soon be time I quit here. But uh, and I do know that. I'm going to read another scripture. And uh, I intended to quote to you some songs this morning. But it just didn't seem to go that way so far. But I will quote this one. And it goes like this. It said, I better stay here. I don't wander much anyway. But it says, must Jesus bear the cross alone? And all the world go free. No, there's a cross for everyone. And there's a cross for me. Glory be to God. And then there's another one that says this. I must needs go home by way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I can ne'er gain sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross I miss. That's the way it is. There's no way you can. And I always have loved to sing, I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. That's what you're going to do. There's been a cross. The cross of Jesus Christ has done many things for you. It has identified uh, you with him. You have been identified with him in his death as well as in his resurrection. You know, Brother Berg, I've got to tell you this. There was a man that I know to be in his 80s, and he walked out here behind me last night, and he caught up with me, and he looks the picture of health, and I wondered if it was him. And he said, my, that was a timely message. In your 80s, you believe in going right on into life. You know, I don't want us... It's fine, I, I know as well as you do that if I died or you died, Paul said something about being absent from the body is present with the Lord. That's a, that's a great consolation. But even in spite of that, I don't want to die. You know, some way or other, this challenge of the kingdom, this glory of the kingdom just before us, I would like to walk in the resurrection life right out into it, wouldn't you? Amen. Glory be to God. Just walk in the resurrection life. I'm thankful we have a brother that's an elder in the church. I don't think he's here yet in Saskatoon, and he's I think he's about 87, and uh, his mind is as clear as mine is, or maybe clearer. Ministers, he could minister on the cross of Jesus Christ on a Sunday morning just as well as we're ministering on it. Brother can tell you about the healing power of God and about all the wonderful unfolding revelation of this move of the Spirit about as well as we can. He's 87 years old, and he's looking forward to walk into the kingdom. Glory be to God, and I hope every one of you are. Praise his wonderful name. Oh, glory to God. There's one hymn that I really love. I've always loved these hymns. I suppose that's the reason that I memorize some of them. And uh, this one, we've sang it from time to time, and I love it. It goes like this. Beneath the cross of Jesus, I fain would take my stand. The shadow of a mighty rock within a weary land. A home within the wilderness. Uh, a shelter. Well, I forget how that part goes. Uh, rest upon the way from the burning of the noontide heat and the burden of the day. Glory to God. That's what the cross will do. I take, oh, uh, I take, oh, give me a hymn book here. Oh, I got one here. I got to repeat that to you because that is, has so much wonderful things in it. 
Glory to God, I should have been able to remember that one. But you know, uh, and that's not getting old either, Peter. It isn't. That man, whatever's wrong, if my memory is short, it's going to get better. Praise God. All right. I think I uh, can find it here in a minute. Would you believe it? It's not in that song of praise, and I thought it would surely be in there. But, oh, here it was. Thank you, Ernst. I knew somebody would come to my rescue. Glory to God. Because this means something to me, along the light I've been talking to you this morning. The next verse goes, Upon that cross of Jesus, mine eyes at times can see the very dying form of one who suffered there for me, and from my smitten heart with tears, two wonders I confess, the wonders of redeeming love and my own worthlessness. Glory to God. This here, a brother and this sister that wrote this hymn, must have let the world go by to know no gain nor loss, my sinful self, my only shame, my glory, all the cross. And then I'll read one more scripture, and then I'm going to close. If you want to turn with me over to the uh, first chapter of Colossians, and I'll just read a verse there. It's a wonderful scripture on the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And one thing I am thankful as I'm turning to this today we have an empty cross, don't we? We don't have one with the body of our Lord on it. We have an empty cross. Because they laid him in the tomb. And then he rose triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. And this is the reason we have this wonderful message to bring to you today. In the first chapter of Colossians and the 20th verse, it says this, And having made peace, through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be in earth or things in heaven, he is reconciling all things unto him through the death of the cross. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Glory to God. You know, not only there are so many things that this brings to us. Brother, uh, we've talked many, many times about the complete redemption from our sins and from our sicknesses and to take on that glorious life that our brother spoke about. But you know, there's, there's one of the Christmas carols that I love, I think, better than anybody, than any of the others. And it goes like this. Uh, he comes, I can quote a part of it at least. He comes to make his blessings known far as the curse is found. Glory to God. That's Calvary for you. Oh, glory to God. I close with this. There's a hymn that I used, uh, I remember singing when I was about 12 years old, the time I gave my heart to God, and it went like this. Where he may lead me, I will go. For I have learned to trust him so. His divine will is sweet to me, for I remember Calvary, how I delight in his command, love to be led by his dear hand, and I remember twas for me that he was slain on Calvary. Onward I go, nor doubt nor fear, happy with Christ my Savior near, trusting that I someday shall see Jesus my friend of Calvary. I'm going to see him. You're going to see him. We're going to behold him with these eyes of ours and not another. Job saw that long before Calvary. He had a glimpse of it. He said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Brother Holt, when you prayed this morning, you said you may not understand, but you can know. And Job didn't understand everything, and neither did Daniel. But Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that I shall stand with him in the latter day upon the earth. Isn't that something? 
And then Daniel didn't understand. He was a wise man. He had a lot of wisdom from God. But he didn't understand everything he was grasping. That he might understand the full import of the end of the age. And uh, the, uh, uh, I guess it was the angel or whatever messenger said to him, Go thy way, Daniel, and seal up the book until the time of the end. But it's not sealed anymore, brother, because we're in the time of the end. Seal it until the time of the end, he said. Thou shalt stand in thy lot in the latter day. And so Daniel was content with this. He gave him another word, and with this I close. He said, many shall be tried and purified and made white. He said, none of the wicked will understand, but the wise will understand. Brother Winter, will you come? God bless you. Thank you. Just before you go, I'd like you to sing something. I know you're hungry, but um, you can sing better on an empty stomach. But I think it would be very fitting this morning after the ministry of our dear brother Oldridge if we sang at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. And the burden of my sin rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now, praise God, I am happy all the day. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. That's the way you look when you're happy. I'd hate to see you when you're sad. I think you can always sing a song like that. I don't mean you just smile like a Cheshire cat, whatever that is. But sing it as though you meant it. At the cross. At... Oh, my goodness. Come on, let's sing it. At the cross where I first saw the light. All right. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. And the burden of my heart, they roll away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I... Amen! Sing it again! At the cross, at the cross, first saw the light and the burden. Happy note. Have a good lunch. God bless you.